This interview is being conducted on September 2nd, 2005 at Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. My name is Kate Wallachie. I am speaking with Mr. Donald Spitzer. Mr. Spitzer was born on November 27th, 1920 in Chicago and now lives in Niles, Illinois. Mr. Spitzer learned of the Veterans History Project. Oh, I forgot to ask. Where did you learn of it? There was a something in the senior center yeah from a poster in the niles senior yeah. center mm -hmm. he has kindly consented to be interviewed for the project here is his or her story his story you're his sorry I forgot to cross that part out <laughs> so we usually start at the beginning chronologically but don't feel tied to it so i always start by asking um, when you entered the service you remember? You were in the. <laughs> <laughs> you I, can cheat I, in the I know I enlisted too. in January of 42. And how come? The war was on. Well, was I enlisted. I wanted to be a cadet, a flyer. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, January 6, 19. No, that was when I was discharged. 18th of March. 42. When you were official. When I enlisted and I left when did I leave? Oh. Oh, you have a no, no, it's not here. This is uh, my overseas mm -hmm. thing. It's not that important. So you don't have to be exact. Well, in Santa Ana, it was uh, about uh, April or May. I'm not sure exactly. And where were you? You were living in Chicago before that? Oh, yeah. Did you live at home with your parents? Or yes. Did you, and what were you doing? What, did, what work did you do before then? What was I doing? I think I worked at that time. I was an order picker for my company. Chicago Avenue. And so then I went in service and I came back and I worked as, let's see, first in the men's store after I came back. And then I uh, worked in another men's store for a number of years on Lawrence Avenue, if you know where that is. And then I got married, 1950, and uh, I worked for, I, uh, I was an accountant. I worked for uh, Mount Sinai Hospital as an accountant. I went into public accounting, and then I started working for the government. I worked in IRS for 25 years. Wow. And I used to do a lot of public relations work for them. I had they could use you now, I think. <laughs> well, I uh, had my own radio show for five years. I did a lot of coordinating of careers for the government. All the agencies sent representatives. And we uh, gave talks at high school and grammar schools in Chicago. That's amazing. And I retired in 1987 long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> so you chose the Air Force, or was it the Army Air Force, or is it? Army Air Force, and U.S. Air Force. You, was there a reason you did that? Well, I wanted to fly. So did you get to fly? Well, I got about $100 of flying, and then I was eliminated from the program. And the reason why is because in California, for two weeks, we did not fly. It was foggy every morning. So I, we didn't have any flying, and I lost my touch of the plane. That's all. That's all I can get attributed to. Yeah. And then I went to a station in Hobbs, New Mexico, and uh, then sent overseas. So what, when, you're, when you first uh, enlisted, when you were first inducted, um, what was it like when you first started out? Well, we had to go to, we went from Chicago, of course, to Santa Ana, California. 
and I went through a basic training course. I think it was eight weeks, something like that. And then we went into cadets, started flying. And I know I started flying here. Started flying July 30th, 1942. Did you, had you ever flown before? Had you ever been in a plane before? Well, yeah, been in a plane, but not flying. Well, a lot of people hadn't been in a plane. How did you get from Chicago to, to Santa Ana? I trained. You trained? Was it a nice train or crowded train? It was a train? passenger train. Some, some guys tell me, you know, they were they had a big luxury train, sometimes they were on a train, it was like just packed full of people. No, it was a passenger train, because this was early in the war, you know. This was about April or May of 1942. Yeah, that's early. So were there, were there a lot of people, um, well, there were other guys, other new cadets? Oh, yeah. Did you meet a lot of people? Oh, yeah. Were they from all over, or were they mostly all from over. Chicago? No. Well, the ones that I started off with were from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think these fellows were mostly from Chicago. But this was in Santa Ana. In Santa Ana, 19, May 1942. And these were from Chicago. So were they people, did you meet people? I, I, know, I never knew them. Yeah, they were just other people. Yeah, just people who did the same as I did because we signed up for, for cadets. And that's where we went. To Santa Ana, California. So how did your family feel about you going into service? Well, <laughs> how would you feel if your son or daughter went into service? They weren't happy about it, but it was a civic thing to do, you know. We had to do it. Were there a lot of people going that, that early, do you think? Not many enlisted. Here, this is all time. Okay. Is there was something up, up on top there. You're just writing I, your name. I something here. Well, okay. I can make up a name for you. Yeah. But we could put in your own. Okay. That and this is yours, I'm That's sure. Mine. Sorry about that. No, we, uh, I decided that the war was important and uh, not many people have listened, believe me. They were all conscripted, drafted to go into. That's why they had no choice. I wanted a choice. That's what a lot of guys have said. A lot of the, uh, a lot of people I talked yeah. to who were in the Navy said, you know, they they enlisted because they wanted to be in the yeah. Navy. They didn't want to yeah, be. Yeah. See the, the one, on the serial number, indicates uh, that you enlisted. Oh. I didn't know the that. three is, uh, I believe, was drafted. Hmm. So you, what did you learn in basic training? How to be a soldier, <laughs> how to you, shoot a gun. Did you think it was going to be useful later? Well, no, but uh, it was, in, you know, necessary for at least to get uh, soldiering, the activities of a soldier, and uh, the mess halls and all that kind of stuff, and camaraderie, more or less to learn more about the fellows that you were with and where they uh, ended up. And as I say, most of them were killed in training or I miss, I lost track of them during the war, but I survived. Now you said there was somebody, that you said you had a picture of some guys who were killed during training. 
Yeah, it's in there. That's something there. Was that common that people no, while they no, were No, they... Yeah, these guys. This is 1944. No, it couldn't have been. Maybe it's just marked that way on the back of the picture. No, because 44, I was overseas. Yeah. So then after your basic training, where did you, you were in Santa Ana to learn to, to fly? No, Santa Ana was just basic training. Oh, okay. Then I went to Santa Maria, California. Oh, that's why. I had my saints mixed up. Yeah. And uh, I was there for about, well, from July 30th to, uh, September 26th. And you were a, a steerman, you said? Steerman, yeah. That's what we flew. Mm -hmm. The open cockpit, two passenger with the helmets and the goggles and all kinds of stuff. And my instructor taught me combat maneuvers. He showed me how to get on the ground from about 10,000 feet up in about 10 seconds. Just boom, down and up. And when I first uh, went up where they showed me that uh, we were going to have loop-the-loops today, I didn't have breakfast or lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't throw up. I never <laughs> threw up. But I, it was fun. And the instructor, as I say, taught me all kinds of uh, maneuvers for when you're in upside down and loop the loops. And I enjoyed it. But then the next point was a closed cockpit two people in it, one uh, low wing, what they call a monoplane, and uh, I couldn't control it too much. One fellow almost killed me, though, and he had previous instruction. He was a flight, uh, not an instructor, but he had flight training, and uh, it was a what we call a buddy system where he would take the plane off and land it. And when I was up there, I'd have a, she, uh, well, a screen around me, and I'd fly just an instrument. Mm -hmm. And when he came that in for a... That been scary? No. No? No. It was... Uh, you felt like you knew what you were doing. Yeah, it was interesting. But he, he coming down this kind of plane, if you came up too high, landed, you had to come out this way and then go down. Well, he came in too high and one of the wings ripped, dropped. And if, if it hits the wing, you're gone. And luckily, somehow or other, he was able to straighten it out before. And I told the uh, instructor about that and he took him up for a flight train and you know, they, they eliminated him because he could not, he didn't have depth perception, mm. even though he had flown before. Did they do a lot of medical testing to see what you could, to see how well you could see in that? Oh yeah, always. And they, we also had the uh, uh, training, trainers, where you go into a uh, uh, cockpit on the ground, and you fly just by using visual contact. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. It sounds like it. Yeah. And I learned a lot uh, there. Was it hard going from being, I mean, you were a grown man, was it hard going from being, you know, rather independent to having to follow orders? No. Didn't bother you? No. No. When I was, uh, in Hobbs, New Mexico, 
I uh, did a lot of uh, air control. I heard of the uh, flights coming in. I managed the planes, tell them where to land and what runway and all that stuff. It's supposed to be a very stressful job, is it? It is. But uh, I managed. <laughs> so then when you, so you were eliminated? From flying. From flying. I went to Hobbs, New Mexico. And then what did you do? Well, that's what I say. I did air, right, air control air and uh, just uh, general things until I was shipped out. So where did you end up when you were shipped out? Well, that's when I ended up in China and India. Oh, well, tell me about it. Well, this is these. Yeah, I left Hobbs May twenty third, nineteen forty three. I went to uh, Chicago. They gave you a pass, you know. A so did you get to visit your family? Yeah. Was it nice? Yeah. Well. Or was it harder because you got to see them? Well, it wasn't hard, but you were happy to see your family, you know. Before going overseas, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So I, I left Chicago. I went to Greensboro, North Carolina. Then I left, I was there from May to August. What were you doing there? Just nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Just waiting for overseas assignment. Wow. So what did you do all day when you were doing nothing? Do you remember? Did you visit Greensboro? Or? Yeah, we went traveling around there. and. Uh, we did a lot of sports. We played baseball and football and whatnot. And then I went to Newport News, Virginia uh, on August 21st. And I was there for eight days and uh, got on the troop transport at uh, about 9.30 at night. Wow. August 29th. We left the U.S. In the, in the morning. We arrived at Panama September 3rd, about four days, and I went ashore. Oh, and I bought boxes of candy at the PX there, because I knew they didn't feed you very well, you know, because I knew already that I, what I needed, that, that I was Night next to the mess hall, several of us would, I'd go in, put Kleenex in my pockets, line them, and go in and take cans of food. Uh, I remember particularly little hot dogs, <laughs> things like that that you could eat, you know. And uh, line, I had my pockets lined, and we fed ourselves very well. <laughs> And in order to get it go in there, you had to put your watch in a lapel so they know you're on what they call KP, mm -hmm. kitchen police. Mm -hmm. So we do that, walk in, and scavenge around, <laughs> and then walk out, take the watch off. That's all. And you never got in trouble for doing that, huh? No, they never caught us. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay, then we arrived. In Panama, as I say, I bought candy, boxes of candy. I had some money at the time. Was it from somebody else, or did you have money because they actually paid you? They paid, they had it. Yeah. Yeah. I had some, it wasn't expensive, you know, because it was, you're in a PX, uh, which is the uh, army uh, store, more or less. Then we, Went through the canal on September 4th, and September 6th crossed the equator. I'm now a shellback, they call it. Uh, Did they do, was there any any ceremony yes. when you crossed the equator? Oh, yeah. What was it like, do you remember? It was, uh, 
they they had a pool on the thing and they put a board across it and you had to walk across the board several you know represented it. i didn't do it yeah. but it was uh, and a lot of them fell in and september 12th very rough seas mm. and extremely rough seas was it bad yeah had you been on a ship before when you when you no went i tell you i never got sick no, but uh, a lot of people did. Yeah. They were in the latrine throwing up or on the side of the ship throwing up or whatnot. But when we left the U.S. Uh, from the canal, we had escorts because there were 15,000 troops on board. Wow. We had heavy cruiser, we had an aircraft carrier, we had four destroyers, and uh, a light cruiser escorting us. So it was very interesting. And they said that our next stop would be Melbourne, Australia. Then we crossed the international date line and I lost the date. Oh, that's <laughs> terrible. Wow. So what? I get it back yes, later. <laughs> <laughs> then we sighted New Zealand. And I changed time for the eighth time, arrived at Melbourne, Australia. We only got uh, on shore. Changed time again for the ninth time. And I started taking Atabrin, which is for malaria. Because you were going to India. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And across the 180s meridian, and now in the order of the Golden Dragon. <laughs> That was another I, I one. I forgot. Right? I've got those uh, papers showing. I, I have them in a different place. I mm -hmm. forgot to bring them. Arrived at Bombay, India on October 4th. Yeah. No, 7th. Mm -hmm. And arrived at Lake Beale, 126 miles north of Bombay. That's when I won 1,200 rupees in a crap game. <laughs> I left Lake Beale for Calcutta, destination Kunming, China. We left on a train. Yeah. The train was so bad, there were no seats, there were benches. And uh, we were so afraid of getting malaria that we slept with like a uh, netting around us. Mm -hmm. And we had to sleep on the benches, and they were slat benches. Oh. No, no blankets, nothing. Was it hot in India? Yeah. And you were there for you were there for a couple weeks. It looks like. Yeah, Bombay. Did you oh, get to we, see any of India? When we were in Bombay, we had some experiences. Um, a lot of snakes in India. And we, we had cots with, uh, you know, and they had mattresses. Mm -hmm. They had, the cots had like straps. And then we had a, a mattress, a very thin mattress on it. And one of the fellows one night, uh, his mattress got soaked or something and he didn't have a mattress. So we had to sleep just on the slats and we found he, he was hollering. A snake came up underneath and bit him. And we had to examine to see if it was a poisonous snake. Luckily, it wasn't. <laughs> but we used to walk around the camp in Bombay, India, with boots up to here. And I carried a, a flashlight and a bamboo rod. Right. And, well, we'd be coming along, and all of a sudden, in front of us, Cobra would stick its head up. That's the flashlight blinded them. You take the bamboo rod, you whacked them, killed them before he got uh, to you. So that was, uh, I was one of the only ones that had flashlights. <laughs> so I was the leader of it. So where did you get the flashlight from? Well, I carried it with me. Uh. And uh, there was another 
incident, we were sleeping one night, and we had been to town and brought some chicken, and they ate it in the uh, tent and left the bones of the package on a small table there. And we hear crack, 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 crack. And I took my flashlight and shined it. There was a hyena <gasps> eating the bones of the chicken. And we chased it away. <laughs> we did had a lot the, of... Did it take the chicken with it? Oh, yeah. He, <laughs> well, he finished, probably. I don't know. He heard <laughs> cracking, you know. He was crunching the bones. Mm -hmm. But uh, we chased them away. But we had a lot of experiences like that. That's amazing. Yeah. That's absolutely amazing. So had you, when you enlisted because you were going to be a um, cadet, cadet yeah. did you think you were going to get to go so many places? I had no idea. Yeah. I didn't know where I was going to, you know, end up. And I wanted to be a combat pilot, though, because one of my instructors showed me all these moves and learning how to fly. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. So I, that's what my had intention you, was. Had you ever been anywhere before, anywhere away from Chicago? Oh yeah, I was in New York and California and traveled around, you know, but nothing. Uh, nothing far away? No, not overseas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, then, yeah, then we went to Calcutta. by train, as I say. It was, I think it was about three or four days. It was terrible. We had um, rations, you know, the uh, packaged meals mm -hmm. to eat there. And you didn't have any little cans of hot dogs with you? No. Oh, I terrible. still had some cans left, but it melted. Oh, no. <laughs> no. I don't think I had any candy because we, on the ship, Ate everything in sight. You said on the on, was that on the troop ship that you were in bunks that were five yeah. high. Five high, and, and I was on the bottom the bunk. bunk. <laughs> Thank goodness. But as I say, it was right next to the mess hall. And every morning when I woke up, all these fellows were sitting on my bunk waiting for the mess hall. To open up. <laughs> Did you not wake up until they sat down? <laughs> mm, <laughs> or you I slept tired? through. <laughs> Most of that until I woke up and there they are sitting there, you know. They didn't care whether I was sleeping or not. <laughs> but uh, we were always usually first in the mess hall when we, you know, for different meals because we were right there. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then destination Kunming, China. We were at, arrived at a camp 35 miles outside of Calcutta. I visited Calcutta. Was it different than Bombay? Oh, yeah. yeah. Calcutta is filthy. Yeah. yeah. Bombay was, uh, well, we didn't get really into Bombay because we were on about 26 miles north of Bombay. Mm -hmm. I think that's where, 126 miles oh, north really of Bombay. No, I never got to Bombay. But uh, was dirty, huh? when we, we left and went to Bombay for the train, then we arrived at a camp 30 miles, 35 miles outside of Calcutta. I visited Calcutta. Then we left for the hump, which was the mountains between India and China. Mm -hmm. Camped overnight at the railroad station by train. Then I went, arrived at Hump Control, and then we flew over the hump on a C-47, which was a troop transport. Was it painful? Was it like? There's seats all around, no seats, you know, rows of seats, mm -hmm. but like a bench all the way around. We sat on there and they flew us over. That was, that was it. And then I was assigned to the intelligence office of the, fight, of the Flying Tigers, the 51st Fighter Group. So what did that mean? 
Well, the, you know what the flying tigers were. Okay, they were. Uh, but you can tell the Library of Congress. Huh? I said you can tell the Library of Congress, though. Well, they know. <laughs> but no, they were uh, volunteer fighters, flight, flight uh, pilots, volunteer pilots. They were from uh, Canada. U.S., England, all these, uh, they, and then they had it, uh, I have books on the Flying Tiger. My son-in-law gave me a couple of books on them. So what did you do then? Well, it was intelligence. Yeah. Um, we briefed the pilots, these ones that they had, the, we had different planes, mostly P-40s with the uh, tiger heads or shark's heads on the painted on. Mm -hmm. If you remember pictures of them. And uh, I would brief them, or we, the group, you know, on what they would come across. We had pictures, photographs, mm -hmm. and where to go, uh, what uh, height to fly in for surprising them and drop bombs on the either jet planes or some supplies that they had in fields that the Japanese uh, were. And then when they came back, they had uh, photos of what they damage they had done. And we processed those and forwarded them to the, uh, our intelligence in, uh, how did you? China. How did you? How were you able to share that information? How did you forward to them? Did you send send copies by courier? Did you use codes or? It was what? generally by courier, yeah, because there are no computers yeah. to send it to them. <laughs> no email. No fax machine. <laughs> no, it was uh, mostly by uh, and we, General Chenault was the in charge of the U.S. troops in China. I saw him a couple times too. Really? But, uh, okay, then from on December 24th, New Year's Eve, or Christmas Eve, the Japs bombed us at night on Christmas Eve. We, uh, uh, our, we had a place to go to keep away from the bombs, you know. Mm -hmm. And in China, they bury their dead on the flat ground and put mounds of earth around it, mm -hmm. above it. And dogs would go in, to burrow into it, take the bones out. There were no cow coffins. <coughs> and they'd pull the bones out and eat them, you know. They didn't care. And we had our safe place they dug trenches in and around these graves. So the graves were up there, we were down below. Mm -hmm. and we jumped into these trenches to get away from the bomb, and a lot of times, crunch, crunch, you'd be jumping on bones of people. Yeah. You know, so we got so used to it. Were you in a building when you were in China? Were you staying in a building? Oh, yeah, we had in... uh, uh, a mess. Because uh, you weren't in tents anymore. No, we weren't in tents. They had permanent uh, places for us. Unless there were bombs, in which case you'd have to yeah. go in the trenches there. So, but uh, that was uh, interesting there. It must have and been that, very frightening. It was frightening to be bombed, yeah. But uh, they usually bombed the airfield, and they weren't very accurate, thank goodness. <laughs> but. Uh, Many, many nights we were uh, alerted to the fact that bombers were on the way, or at least fighter planes from the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And uh, we learned a lot, stay out of the way. <laughs> yeah, then January 28th, I was transferred to a finance office because 
the fellow in charge of my group of intelligence, he wanted a friend of his we went to school with in his squadron. So I got kicked out. They sent me to the finance office, which I didn't like at all. So I complained and they transferred me to a different a bomb squadron. They had a big show on March 10th celebrating the second anniversary of the 14th Air Force. What kind of a show? Well, uh, entertainers and what well, I don't remember who. Was it exciting? Was it? The what? Was it exciting? Was it a neat show or was it kind of? No, it was uh, interesting. Any show was interesting at the time. You know, we didn't get any. The only time, the only thing we did was saw movies at night. And that's when we went with the flashlights and the bamboo rods to where the movies were shown and get snakes out of the way. Yeah. Oh, it was really, we saw a lot of cobras. Mm -hmm. But they didn't do any damage, thank goodness. You were, so you're still in, you're still in China when you were oh, yeah. to the finance office and then when yeah. you... Yeah. And then, this is March 10th, April 6th, my, uh, January 28th is when I was transferred there. Mm -hmm. And I was there until April 6th. I complained that this fellow got me out. I didn't want to be in finance. So I complained and they switched me to this, what they call the 308 Bomb Squadron, which was in Chengdu. So what were you doing there with them? Uh, uh, actually, I was intelligence there too in the bomb. This was B-24s. And I left for Chengdu, arrived I left uh, then I was assigned to one of the squadrons of the of that. I was there for well about nine days. And most of these were then we were I was told we were June fourth. I was told we were going to Rupsi, India, which is uh, the other part of the hump. They had fuel transport planes, the B twenty fours were fitted to transport gasoline from India into China. Or China, yeah, from India to China, and this was India. Rupsi was in India. <laughs> Have won $160 this month playing. <laughs> so we know that you spent a lot of your time yeah. playing cards? You no, playing cards no, or were craps. You, oh, playing craps. Yeah. You didn't even need cards for that. That's a lot easier. No. You just can throw the dice. That's right. Did you keep your own dice or did you, did you all oh, share? Oh, we switched. I, I didn't, I had some dice, but uh, everybody had dice there, you know. Oh, and I, when I was in China, I had a, um, I should have brought that. I have a, my name in Chinese. Oh, really? What they call a chop. And it was, <coughs> <coughs> it's a square uh, marble thing that you, put on an ink pad and put your, that your personalized, uh, your name in Chinese. Oh, neat. I forgot about that. Okay, and then June, I was in Rootsy, and August 15th, the war is over. Sweating out here. And then I won $200 so far this month. <laughs> Ten days at Cassie Hill. It was a resort, more or less. Uh, um, they had games and horseback riding and uh, all kinds of things in Cassie Hill. It was a, a rest camp. Yeah. Were 
no, where, where is that? That was in India. In India. Oh, how neat. And I arrived in, in India November 1st. And we went from there to Kanchwapara, which was in India. And I was processed to go back to on the to, on the transport. And we got on the Marine Devil, but it's an interesting thing. They had certain points that you were given for being overseas and being in certain combat units and uh, they had this ship was already had already sailed. And when we got there, we had so many more points than those on the ship had, they called the ship back. And they refused to get off. And they had to go down there and put the uh, tear gas in there to get them out. So they got them off the ship. We got on the ship, our group there, because we had so many more points to go back. And we, that was on November 21st. We sat at Manila. I got to go on shore in Manila. So and what was that like? You were so close to home. Well, no. Manila? <laughs> well, you were on your way. Yeah, we were on the way back. And then I crossed the international date line. Once again. And we had. Thursday twice, I gained back the day that I lost. So did you have to eat the same thing in the cafeteria because it was Thursday twice? No. <laughs> and uh, it was, I know it was 42 days going from Newport News, Virginia, through the canal, around Australia, to Bombay, India. Coming back, it was about 30 days. Oh. I was on a merchant marine transport and I got special treatment. I had flags and different things from uh, when I was an intelligence you know, and I gave to the uh, people in the uh, the ship and I had pillows, sheets, blankets oh, and luxury. Huh? yeah the, nobody had them but I did. And because I gave that, I, they would let me come to the mess hall about 11.30 at night, and they would cook up meals, steak and eggs and bacon and all that kind of stuff. I got fed very well because I had all this stuff that I gave them. I was part of the crew, and then I would sleep uh, most of the day and then go back down at night mm -hmm. with uh, the fellows in the, on the troop transport and the uh, Merchant Marine. So it was quite an interesting uh, experience there. And finally arrived at Tacoma, Washington. We stayed there for four days and it was terrible weather. Uh, at that time, December and then I took the train to Fort Sheridan. I arrived there, it took up three days by train. And uh, then I was discharged on the 6th of January, 1946. Wow. And home too. That's what I have here. That's all, brother. Yeah. I got out. <laughs> that's amazing. So that's an experience. So that's it. How did you stay in touch with your family that whole time? Were you able to? By mail, air mail, usually. And uh, it was the only way. So I write them maybe once, twice a week, something like that. And I'd get some mail occasionally, because we had what we call APOs, Army Post Office numbers. Mm -hmm. They would address them, and sometimes the mail would be two, three weeks after, you know, came to the 
area. They had to get the mail to where you were. So we knew where the post office box that we where we were. But we never, of course, could tell them where we were. Because they wouldn't, that was a no-no. They would scratch it out. They it were open to all the mail. They screened, censored any mail. So they censored the mail that you sent out. Did they censor the mail that oh, people yes. were sending in? Well, no, not necessarily, because what could they couldn't, yeah. uh, you know, tell you anything. There's a really funny story um, that Richard Feynman tells in his in one of his books. Maybe surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman, where he talks. He was working at um, Los Alamos, and he talks about sending a sending a letter to his wife, and they cut all the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cut all the pieces cut it out, out of yeah. it. Yeah. Revealed too much. Yeah. So when you weren't when you weren't on duty, you were in you were in so many different places. When you weren't on yeah. duty, did you get? Started? I had different jobs, doing mostly intelligence work. But when I was in uh, Rupsi, India, we were, as they say, the planes were uh, taking off from China, from India to fly over the hump to China to, for fuel, aviation fuel. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were there for, to start the B-24s, to process them and get them filled with the gas and fly over the hump to land in Kunming, China and uh, use it for the combat planes. But uh, I, didn't, I don't remember doing too much no, we were, we did have, there was one other incident. Uh, we had squadron baseball games. Uh, they were 12 inch uh, teams. And we got to India waiting to get on the ship. One of the, I took talking to one of the fellows, and he was a semi pro softball pitcher semi-pro, wow. more or less. So I got he and a couple of other fellows together, and we would uh, actually uh, ask other teams if they wanted to play us, and we'd bet. And he was so good, we won every game. <laughs> we made money that way. <laughs> But he was good. They weren't solely reliant on craps then. That's no. Yeah. no. <laughs> so what did you do with your money after you won it? I sent it home. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Not too much candy to no, buy. No, not, not too much to buy. But uh, I did bring a lot of uh, silks home. Wow. And... Uh, just recently, when, when I was getting out of my house into where I am now, a condo, uh, I sold some of the soaks. Wow. In fact, a lot of my stuff, there's a place called The Final Approach in Glenview. It's a Air Force something uh, less, like a museum type. Yeah, and I sold him a lot of stuff. And he's made a, I have to go there and see what, what he did, because it was a lot of my stuff. I had uh, bomb photos, showed uh, the planes dropping the oh, wow. uh, bombs on Japanese, and there was uh, on Hong Kong, and different uh, places on trains, and whatnot of the Japanese that were. <coughs> <coughs> so all this uh, is part of my experiences. That's amazing. So um, I asked all those questions. Okay, what else do, you got? Do, 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 do. Um, well, you were, so you were in the service when the war ended. Yeah. And in the I was overseas at that time. Yeah, you were. So did you did you know about the um, 
Did you know about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or did you just know? Oh no, sure. We we got all the inf intelligence, right. particularly. Right. In intelligence. We got all the information. So did you know in advance, or did no. you know? No. You just no. Everything it was knew. hush hush. Nobody knew in advance because everything was very secretive there. So uh, when we found out that the war was over, of course we were very accelerated. Going home, you know, alive, <laughs> which is uh, to us very important. <laughs> I think it's important to most yeah. people. Oh yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, oh, I know what I forgot. Do you celebrate any holidays? Do you remember what you did for holidays? Thanksgiving primarily. We served the turkey, you know, a regular Thanksgiving meal. Uh, Christmas was not too important. You didn't you had no gifts to give to or receive. And uh, <coughs> most of the holidays, Fourth of July, eh, you know, just uh, another day, considering uh, you couldn't celebrate it as such. But uh, we, we had, when we lived, when we were in China, we had houseboys took care of the, everything, mm -hmm. laundry and everything. Oh, another thing, I never smoked. And the PX there, they would sell you cigarettes, I think it was two and a half dollars a carton at the time. And so I would buy some of the cigarettes and the houseboy, I put them in my pillow cartons, and the houseboy would take them, and he'd give me about ten dollars for each one. So I made money that wow. way too, because I never smoked, and I would trade cigarettes with some of the fellows for candies and whatnot. Uh, so we were able to, I was able to do that too. So Did you? yeah, all you know, thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever have to go to the doctor or or? Anything we ever, we ever well, we yes. Ever one one time I remember, we had just arrived at some place, and we had mess kits uh, opened up, and locked in mm -hmm. canteens, and we couldn't find. Usually they have boiling hot water that you wash them in order to sterilize. We couldn't find any at this one place, and we were hungry. So we just took our mess kits, and they plopped the food in it. We ate it. And the next day, I was sick. I had to I was throwing up for about two days. Yeah. I had to go to the hospital. But uh, it they gave you medicine. A couple of days, it subsided. It was a bacterial you know, infection. But that was about the only uh, time I was in a hospital, I said. But I do remember when we first got in service, they gave you shots. And a lot of the fellows were very skeptical about getting shots. They'd be standing in line and passing out, <laughs> anticipating. But so uh, we get, uh, we got all kinds of different shots. Uh, <clears throat> but the, the, we were taking Adabrin, which is for malaria, and you would turn yellowish. Your skin would get yellow from the Adabrin. Hmm. And finally, when we were on the way back, uh, we stopped taking it, and then it disappeared, the yellowish. Hmm. And then you would know whether you had malaria, because it stopped it if you did have it. Fortunately, I did not have it. That's good. Because <laughs> it was very prevalent in India, yeah. malaria, the mosquito. So, uh, what else? What else? Uh, oh, I always ask people this, um, whether you had any religious services while you were in the service, or you talked to the chaplains or anything. Well, no, I'm Jewish, so there's not much the chaplains there 
are very seldom rabbis or anything like that. So I'm not that very religious anyway. But uh, I never really, I never observed services of the Jewish religion in service. That's interesting. Did you feel, did you, um, did anybody pay attention? Did you feel like it was any different to be Jewish in the service versus no. being Catholic? No, no, nothing. Nobody paid any attention to what your religion was, whether it was uh, Catholic or Jewish or anything else. That's very interesting. It's very interesting when I talk to people, their different <coughs> responses to the question. Yeah. It's always it's always neat to hear. My mother is a is a chaplain, so I always ask. Oh. <laughs> I always want to know. Uh -huh. um, and did you have you were you were on a troop ship, and we're in the library, so I have to ask if there were ever any books to read. I had books along with me, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a little paperback thing, and I had a chess set, a very small. In fact, I still have it. It was about this big, That's tiny. and it opened up, and I played chess uh, with people. Uh, <laughs> when you weren't shooting craps. Right? Yeah, when yeah. I wasn't. But <laughs> or playing I mean, baseball. Well, on the ship, uh, it you was. Couldn't play baseball. <laughs> <laughs> no, couldn't play baseball. <laughs> but uh, I, I played chess a lot, and I'd read a lot on the ship because we were on it, you know, twenty-four hours hours. Uh, day yeah. and it was boring and at night you couldn't have be on deck because uh, uh, they were afraid that you some people would light a cigarette or something and at sea you could see that for miles and we were we had troop transports uh, uh, all these escorted ships escorting us we did have one experience where they thought that they saw a submarine somewhere near us. So all these destroyers would go scooting towards where they think they saw the sub, and uh, we never had really any experience, um, any threats uh, at that time, luckily. But uh, there was always a possibility that uh, they, because that's a, that would be a big blow yeah. with 15,000. Yeah, at one time. So did you meet a lot of people on the troop ship from other places, or did oh, you meet yeah. with your yeah, own crowd? Oh, yeah, we had lots of conversations, uh, different uh, people. And of course, we had a group that we kept, and we went in <laughs> to get the foods. And uh, I supplied them with uh, the candy bars for, for that I food. bought. Yeah. yeah. And I traded them for different things, and it was... Uh, experience of, of a lifetime. Yeah. That would be. <laughs> I always wonder because that most of the people I interview were are from Chicago and I always wonder if they met people from small places who, you know, maybe well, never yeah. saw 15,000 people in one place before. Mm -hmm. That's great. Oh yeah. It's a, a melting pot of everybody in service, you know. And occasionally you'd meet people from Chicago and uh, it was interesting to find out where they lived and where you lived and all things like that. About your neighborhood. Yeah. So what did you do right after you were discharged? Do you remember? Right after, yeah. I went to work. I went to work in a men's store in the Loop. A friend of mine managed it. And I worked there because uh, well, I was always interested in fashions, men's fashions. I dressed, uh, well, you can see, Very nice. all coordinated. And uh, <clears throat> then um, I went into accounting after that. And that's what you said, even though you hated being in that finance office. Yeah, yeah. But then I went into accounting. I worked for a public accounting firm. Uh, they sent me to New Orleans, of all places. Um, I was there for about two, three weeks with them. And we <coughs> ordered a big department store down there. And I would, of course, live down there. 
and I was still single. No, come to think of it. At that time, no. When I worked in public accounting, I when I was I was in the men's store, and then I got married, and I worked in the men's store for a short time, and then I went into public accounting, and I worked for this big firm that sent me to New Orleans, and then I worked for a very small accounting firm. I was the only employee, and uh, there was the my boss and his uncle. Uh, ran the place, and I did everything. Um, in fact, uh, my boss got monolucleosis, whatever, and he couldn't do anything for about uh, a month or two. So I did everything. I ran the accounting company. I, I remember staying up one night, uh, all night, to do a, an audit do some uh, of a company that needed uh, a particular uh, balance sheet and whatnot uh, to get a loan. And I worked all night long doing this. And I brought it to this fellow's uncle about 7 o'clock in the morning. And then I went home and went to sleep. <laughs> but I did it. And then I found that uh, I wanted to get into the government. So I applied for IRS because of my accounting background. And uh, at first I didn't, uh, I wasn't called. And then I found one of the fellows that I knew who lived next to me in Niles also worked for IRS and he told me what to do to to get my uh, resume more or less up to date and I did it I was accepted and I came in at a very high uh, uh, class more or less because of my background and experience so uh, <clears throat> my IRS experiences were very very interesting I did very little individual returns. I did mostly large corporations. So everybody I talked to went, oh, IRS, <laughs> no good, no good. <laughs> oh, and my, my wife and I did a lot of traveling. We had been on 57 cruises. Oh, my goodness. And we would go on two or three a year. We started cruising in 1970. Four or five of my daughters were out of high school. They were, one was married or getting married, and uh, in fact, they got married in 1972. And in 74, we started traveling. And as I say, 57 cruises. Wow. Did you ever go back to where you had been during the war? No. I didn't want to go back there. Yeah. Not really. Not even Australia. Well, Australia we went to, sure. But we flew to Sydney. In fact, my daughter is a travel agent. And she kept telling us all about different... <coughs> she called us one day. She said, this is a trip you have to go on. We fly to Australia from the... Chukong, of course. Mm -hmm. We got on a ship for nine days, Princess Cruise, come back to Sydney, stay in Sydney in a hotel for four days, and then fly home. Wow. The entire trip was $1,700 a person. That isn't, that Sign wouldn't even take the one. airfare. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. great. So did you, um, did you stay in contact with anybody you met in the service? Have any service. Money? The only one is this one fellow, uh, Pete Clementi, who lives in Florida. I just got a card from him. Um, uh, <coughs> <coughs> congr 
gradually on my 55th wedding anniversary, which would have been August 26th, and I immediately wrote him, and I told him, I said, your card was very welcome, but my wife passed away in March, and we never reached our 55th anniversary. In fact, I even sent him some of the pictures. He's on some of these, and I sent him some of the pictures from back then. <coughs> so did you join any veterans organizations? Any what? Any veterans organizations no, like the VFW? No, I didn't feel like American going Legion? into the American Legion or anything. We always ask. Like that. I know. I just <laughs> didn't uh, interest me. But I do a lot of volunteer work for the Niles Senior Center. I, uh, <coughs> I've been doing it for 15 years now. Wow. I uh, uh, coordinate and uh, call people for carbon monoxide testing where we send the inspectors out mm -hmm. because it almost killed us. Oh my One of the uh, times uh, we had just put a new furnace in and they had what they call a damper. It was supposed to automatically open and right create uh, anyway I was working at that time it was about 1985 86 <coughs> and uh, I would come home and my wife said I feel so sluggish today but we always sleep with the windows open at night so uh, then uh, I said well we have to go away more you know to get uh, so finally my wife was playing cards with some women and they said that the village checks for carbon monoxide and we called she called the village and gave them our symptoms they sent somebody out right away oh, wow. and they found that there was a this damper never opened up it kept closed so there was carbon monoxide in the house but because we slept with the windows open so they immediately called the furnace people. They came and took the damper out, and they sent us to the hospital. We put uh, had oxygen for an hour or so, <coughs> and uh, that's why I decided to volunteer for carbon monoxide because I knew the effects, and I was getting you know, right. you get a little dizzy and uh, it could kill you, obviously. A lot of people have died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Yeah, they don't know that it was no. happening in there. <coughs> so did you, how did your, how did serving in the military and your experiences, did that affect your life? How did, what do you think? No, when I got out of service, I forgot all about service. Yeah. I didn't want to be reminded, more or less. I was happy to get out alive and uh, forget about anything that, that really occurred there. Although I have all the memory. In fact, I even learned Chinese on the ship going, you know, we knew we were going to China yeah. or India and China. So we didn't know whether we were going to stay in India or go to China. So I took some classes in Chinese, Mandarin Chinese. <coughs> and I have all my notes yet. You can speak Mandarin Chinese phonetically and write it. Man, uh, Cantonese. Cantonese, you can't. It's a sing-song and you can't. Mm -hmm. and in fact, at this point, I still remember the numbers in Chinese after all these years because there are only 10 numbers in Chinese in Mandarin. You have 1 to 10, 11 is 10 plus 1, 20 are two tens, things like that. Oh, wow. And I still remember it's Yi Er San Su Wu Leo Chiba Jo Shu. That's one to ten in Chinese. After sixty <laughs> some odd years. It's still there. <laughs> yeah. Did you um, did you ever use it when you were in China? Oh yeah. yeah. I used it quite a bit. How come? Because we were in China. Yeah, but what did you do? Well, we would bargain with the natives. We'd he'd say how much in yen, and we'd say. I, in Chinese, I say, 
too much. And did it work? He, it worked. He said, you speak Chinese, <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> and they would give it to the price that we wanted. Mm -hmm. So it was helpful. I even learned some uh, Hindu, not much though, because in Hindu they have a lot of, in India, they have a lot of beggars. Mm -hmm. And all the beggars say is bakshis, which means give me something for which you will get nothing in return. <laughs> That's what it means. It's a beggar's term. And the kids would all come up, bakshi sahib, bakshi And we'd give them a lot of candies and, you know, dumb, whatever we had. But it was uh, an experience that is way, way back. Yeah. <laughs> this was 1942 and three and four. And I was out in 1945, yeah, you were 46, right? You were in for a long time. Yeah. Almost four years. Yeah. Because I enlisted, as I say, in March, and uh, I stayed at my job for uh, about two months, and in April or May is when we were sworn in. We were sworn in, actually. I was being paid while I, after I enlisted. Oh, wow. But they said, you wait until you're called. So I waited for a month or two, and then I was called and went uh, on the train to uh, California for training. Now, you were in the Second World War. Did you have any? Um, did you have any relatives who were in the First World War, or have any? My father so was, uh, and he was. My parents were both born in Vienna, and they both came here. Early, my father came at about the age of 18, and he became a citizen, and he worked in World War I as an airplane mechanic, oh, wow. because he was a mechanically trained, and he worked for Nash Automobile, if you remember Nash, yeah? I'm a car girl. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, before it disappeared, but he worked, he was the uh, manager of the uh, service. And I worked uh, several summers <coughs> at for Nash in the parts department and whatnot. And uh, so that's why you wanted to be a flyer, though. Seriously. You no, know I don't know. Mechanics. No, no. But just to have, just to think about airplanes. No, no. I just uh, interested in airplanes, and I thought it would be an unusual. Uh, experience and it was because I enjoyed flying in fact my son-in-law had an airplane and uh, he took us up in it but he would he wouldn't let me uh, huh. assume the controls Did you ever think about going deciding to to fly again no 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 once I was eliminated that was it that was all. yeah was there anything we missed anything you want to add no, I don't think so. I think I got everything, <laughs> didn't we? You, t I, you told me a lot. I don't yes. know. I'm sure there's a lot still left in there. I mean, you got all those numbers. So yeah. You, you yes. uh, no, this, my experiences have been varied and unusual. And uh, I've enjoyed it. And, you know, talking about the cruises, we had my wife... Uh, had some medical problems. She had a uh, heart condition. She had diabetes. And she was starting to get a little forgetful. And she passed away in March. She, in uh, February, she fell down four stairs in her house. Oh hit her head on the bottom stair. And she was in the hospital for 17 days, never gained consciousness. We just had to let go of all life-saving activities. She passed away. I had her cremated, and my daughters have been very, very helpful. They, one of them lives in Bloomingdale and one in Bartlett, and their husbands, and I have one 14, you're going to be 15 this month, grandson, and uh, he's bigger than I am. 
No. <laughs> so do you tell him your stories about being in the war? Oh, yeah. I've been telling him the whole stories, and he looked at this, and very unusual. And uh, my daughter would set up a computer now, and now my wife would never let me have a computer. What did she think you were going to do with Play it? games, <laughs> <laughs> which I do. I play a lot of slots <laughs> on the computer. And I send emails, and my daughters are one is an expert in computers, she works on it all day. The other is a travel agent who, mm -hmm. and my grandson knows computers backwards and forwards, and all of their email addresses, and uh, my uh, two son-in-laws know computers back and forth, and my one son-in-law, the husband of my uh, daughter who is a travel agent, is very mechanically inclined. And he came over to the house and he set up my TVs and the computer and uh, I have cable in all the rooms and uh, uh, they've been very, very helpful since my wife passed away. And uh, they come over every week or two, I take them out for dinner and uh, we, I was able to sell my house in three days. That's how my real estate agent it was a friend of my daughter's, mm -hmm. a travel agent. And she helped me set the program up, and she also helped me get my condo. So I sold my house in three days at the top dollar, yeah. and I bought the, the condo, and I love it. Yeah. It's right in Niles. I didn't want to leave Niles. You don't have to mow the lawn. No. No, no shovel snow. That's what it is. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, as I say, the pe a lot of people in the condo I know. One of the songs is on my bowling team, and we. He's one of the officers of the condo, and uh, several of the other officers are related to people that my daughter knows. So uh, it's. Uh, Unusual to have all the people there, and I play bridge at the senior center, and I bowl with the senior center. Well, you never run out of stuff to do with them. No, world. not uh, with the senior center. I've gone to a number of the, like barbecues and uh, uh, jazz fests and uh, uh, music things through the senior center, and uh, I, I'm. I help with the bridge. I'm in one of the people in charge of it on Tuesdays, and we do mailing at the senior center. So you do everything. Yeah, and the men's club we I belong to, and uh, I just signed up for computer classes. That's a good thing so, to sign up. Oh yeah. For. The ones at the senior center. At or the senior those center. Those are yeah. good classes. People yeah. People come in all the time. Yeah, because I have to learn. I, I know quite a bit about the computer, but I'm going to pre-introduction to computer, okay. and then after that to the computer's next yeah, phase. It, it, sometimes it helps just to hear oh, and yeah. know all the words I took everything. some of the uh, computer books out of here mm -hmm. and some of the video, and it didn't help. No, no. they you, go Unless you know 